Coming up, we poke some dust and naturally some mud. Cute dog learning the ropes. That's the cover, Mitzi. And lots of satisfying repairs, like fixing the pixels. Hello and welcome back to part 4 of Project Rottweil. In this episode we carry on with the rejuvenation process of this neglected 5 series touring and complete some smaller but very satisfying repairs that make the whole car feel that much refreshed and complete. After that, well it's time to recommission it and go for a first drive. Time to reinstall the engine under tray and the lower parts of the fender liner were broken so I bought them brand new. Can I do it with the tires still in place? Okay, okay. Plug in the sensor. Yes. <laughs> then we have these little covers here for the thrust arm bushings. We're missing a spoiler here that I just removed because it was broken and rusty. So I placed an order for a new one and when that comes in, I'm gonna replace it. The six cylinder petrol version of the E39 doesn't have the cover for the transmission which is annoying, but it is what it is. The rear wiper arm is broken, as you can see. We need to fix that. There's a torque screw here, T10. There it is. Got a new one. Ah, that was already loose. Don't lose that washer. Clean this up a bit. Got a brand new wiper arm and blade here. Now we're gonna test it. What? Did it move or what? The washer is working, but the wiper is not working. I think the issue might be that this shaft here is all rusty and stuck because I can hear the relay clicking. And then let's see if we can get it to unfreeze. Oh yeah, this is stuck solid, man. There's a clip here that I'm gonna try and remove. That's the nut removed. Oh! So this is the problem. This is completely seized. The shaft in here, this should move freely. And I'm gonna try and get it unstuck now. So I'm using rust loser and hitting it with a hammer to see if I can get it to loosen up. If not, I'm gonna have to order a new one. Unfortunately, that thing is completely buggered. So I placed an order for a new one, and once that comes in, we'll pick this up. Let's see if we can fix the tailgate struts. That's been driving me absolutely crazy. Remove the cover here. So we have tailgate struts and the glass struts, which I forgot to buy. There's a circlip here that we need to remove. That's out. Now I need to drive this pin out. Try and pull this rubber off. Oh, that's gonna be fun to put back in. I can see why no one ever repairs this. Oh, I see. Now we need to pop it up. Wait, is that already off? It is. There it is. A bit of vacuuming. Here's the new OE one. So now we need to pop this onto the shaft in the back. Ball looking thing. The wires look good. The design is phenomenal. Oh, it's on. Oh, I think it clicked into place. It did, it did. Come in, pin, go in. I can lift the tailgate with my hand. There it is. That's in, it's already holding the tailgate. Clip reattached. Give the wires a second look. Put all of them here look good. None of them are cracked, which is brilliant. Rinse and repeat on the other side. You know what? I can already see some surface rust in there starting to form, and I don't see a way to get in here and just treat all of that unless you were to cut the roof off. So I think I'm gonna put the new strut in and then we're gonna use fluid film and just coat everything inside and prevent it from rusting. There it is. 
Now I'm gonna get compressed there. Brace yourself. Oh my God. Ugh. Okay, I'm gonna go get a mask. Jesus. That was insane. Huh, it didn't break. Now I can clean everything a bit better. Oh my God, look at that. Surface rust right there. Now I'm gonna treat this inside area with cable grease from Liquid Molly, which is like cavity vax or fluid film. And this is gonna prevent further spreading of the rust and also displace moisture. I think we're gonna be doing this every, hopefully every year if I don't forget, because if this gets bad, I imagine you have to cut the roof off either from inside or outside. That can be a huge nightmare. So let's make sure it's protected. That'll do it. If you have a touring, I highly recommend checking out this area. I can't imagine how difficult it would be to fix rust in, inside there. Pop this back in. All right. Let's see. Beautiful. And the straps for the glass, like I said, I forgot to buy them, but they appear to be still in good shape. So I'll order them as well and then replace them at some point. Next up, inner taillights. They are absolutely shot. No amount of polishing is going to fix this because they're physically damaged. The plastic is micro cracked all over the place and they need to be replaced. Also, Mutsi is here enjoying the sunshine. What's up, Mutsi? How do we get to the, oh, is it that easy? Then we have three screws. Mandatory cleaning. Unfortunately, brand new original taillights for the E39 Touring have been discontinued. You can no longer buy them brand new. You can only buy aftermarket garbage, which I don't like one bit. But I got really lucky and I scored these. These are used, but original E39 Touring taillights. This one is from 2015 and that one is from 2016. I paid 250 euros for this on eBay, but that's fine because like I said, you can't buy this brand new anymore. That being said, I'm not gonna throw these away. I'm gonna put them on the shelf because you never know. You might need them for spares or something. You might need that stud or this gasket or whatever. Probably test them now, but first I'm gonna bolt them in then find out they don't work and then I'm gonna have to take them apart again. Mutsi loves the sun, right Mutsi? Fitment is good, right? Yep, Bob's your uncle. That looks so much better, doesn't it? Takes ages off the car. Let's see if they're working. Lights on. Yes, we have there and there. That's all good. <clears throat> How about reverse? Yep, fog lights? Yep, yep. Fully functional, approved Mutsi. I think Mutsi deserves a treat. Don't you Mutsi? Come get it. Big treat for a big dog. Spin like a rat brain. Spin, Mutsi. Spin. Come, Mutsi, come. She loves to sit in my lap and just be cuddled. I love this dog. And you're not even ours. No, no, no. You were licking your butt earlier. You're not gonna lick my face. First things fifth, we need to replace the wiper blades. They are shot. Going with Valeo Viper Blades. Haven't had any luck with Bosch Viper Blades lately. They last about a year, actually less than a year, and then they start to smear. But I used SWF and Valeo on some other cars and they seem to last a bit longer. That works. Anyway, we're gonna be back here a bit later replacing this rubber seal, painting all of this and replacing the cowl. I'm still waiting to get parts for that. Now we can do the mirrors. Both of the mirrors are broken. These are electrochrome power folded mirrors and someone temporarily permanently fixed them with tape. Yeah, that's good, isn't it? Anyway, we need to remove the door panel and bolt it from the back and remove the entire mirror assembly. To get the mirror off, we need to remove the door panel. Oh. Please stop. Sorry, Mitzi. Wait a minute. Hey. 
It works! Oh, there is definitely broken. Will you stop? Okay, I guess we're starting with the right side. Professionally fixed. My gut! And they always have to use the worst tape in the world. We need to replace this broken switch. Well, missing. What do you think, Mutsi? Can I get to that? I can't. I need a different tool, Mutsi. That's the cover, Mutsi, not a screw. Oh, we have stubborn clips. There we are. By the way, I'm gonna need some advice when it comes to upgrading the audio on this car. It's terrible. And yes, I did look into getting the BAV Stage 1 whatever sound system, but it's not compatible with the European E39 because this has the bass, bass sound system. Six speakers in total and they sound like crap. So I'm gonna have to do something else. And I don't feel like splicing wires and you know, I can't do that. So I don't know what to do exactly. Bit the foam. Connectors disconnected. I bought the replacement mirrors. They are power folded electrochrome mirrors with high glass shadow line window trim as you can see. This one is in really good condition. I haven't tested it though, but this one unfortunately started to corrode here, so I can't bolt it onto the car. Instead, we are going to try and salvage this one because the trim on this one looks, well, it's perfect. So let's see if we can repair what's broken inside. Pop the broken glass. There's a tab here that you need to push and then it will come out. Disconnect the wires for the heating. Here's the connector for the electrochrome function. Thankfully this one came with a good one. Now let's see if we can remove this without breaking the tabs. Very good. So ye completely broken. I repaired E39 mirror on my M5. But that was six years ago and I don't remember what I did. So there's that. Okay, before we proceed any further, let's make sure that this one actually works. Yep, this one is working just fine. And the last one is working as well, perfectly. I think they just knocked it out of the gear and thought it was broken and then they used tape to secure it. But it's working perfectly fine. Test concluded, Matsi. Before we proceed with this, first I wanna remove this plastic frame because it's in better condition than this one. Do that for the left side as well paint it and let it dry while we fix this. Fine scotch bright. And with that, off to the paint booth. First, plastic primer. Semi-gloss black paint, I'm gonna do two layers. We can let that dry and we can continue with the mirror repair. Here's what the inside of the mirror looks like. This was not meant to be serviced. I'm gonna pop this housing cover off and take a peek inside and see if we can fix whatever is broken. We have three screws here. That's the little motor, that's fine. Here's what we have inside. This gear here appears to be fine. Whatever is broken is probably in this area here. So I'm gonna try and pop off this clip and see if we can separate these two. I successfully pried off this clip here and now this came apart and this bit here is broken. I think this ring or whatever and that's what's stopping well. That's what makes all of this play in the, in the frame and not making it stop properly. Anyway, now I need to dip in the connector and pull the wires out and take this apart completely. So let's write it on one to five. Depend this one here as well. I need to take apart this as well. And this here is not serviceable. So I'm gonna have to cut these two here and then resolder them later. Well, that's taken apart. And here is the issue. This tab here snapped off. Gonna try and clean up this cover here, see what it looks like clean and if it's worth putting it on the other one. Normally I wouldn't be wasting time on this and just buy a good used mirror that's not corroded and it's working, but they are incredibly difficult to find with this base high gloss shuttle line trim. Hence why we're gonna repair this one. Surface prep. 
gonna go get some polish. Hopefully you can see a bit of a difference there. Still need to do a final pass. That looks a lot better. Not perfect, but for a hand polish, that looks pretty darn good. A lot better than what it was before. So this trim is thankfully reusable. Now I need to do the same thing with the auto mirror, take it apart completely and transfer over the mechanism to this base here. And this is what we need. You can see that this one here is undamaged. So this ring goes here, that goes there. I made a mark as to where I need to put it. And now the most difficult part, putting the clip back on. Just needs to grab and then I can tap it on. Okay, think, threaten, think. I need to support it somehow from the bottom. Oh my God, I, I did it. <laughs> Almost can't believe it. Right, need to tap it in a little bit more. It was a bit of a battle, but somehow I managed to put the clip back on. Now I'm gonna reassemble all of this, replug the pins, and let's test it, see if it works. Gonna apply silicone grease on the gears inside. Now I'm gonna resolder the little switch that I had to cut off. Then the back one goes here. Hit the button. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. There's no electricity to the motor. All right, I'm gonna open it up and see. I chafed two wires that go to the motor here when I was putting the housing back on. I just fixed it, so I think it should work now because it was shorting earlier. Yep. Magnifique! Now we can reassemble it completely. The plastic trim looks brand new. Replacement mirror, clip. It's the mirror installed. Don't forget this. Flipping fantastic. I do need to clean here a little bit first. Oh, I'm not long enough for this. <laughs> sure that's clipped in there. There was one. Before we proceed further, let's test it once more. Yes. See, do we have broken clips? What? Talk about strong clips, man. All are intact. Yes. Now, before you smack them, make sure the clips and the holes line up. Otherwise, you're gonna break. Yeah. Is that how that goes? I don't know, man. I just work here. Replacement window switch. I forgot to put the foam around the speaker here, so let's take it apart again. I could leave it out, but then I wouldn't be able to sleep tonight. There you go. Foam reinserted. Yes. It's not the smoothest operation, but give them a break. They are old power folding mirrors. And I lubed up that one generously. The main thing is it works and it doesn't wobble. The electrochrome is gonna work, adjustment works, the heating works, the power folding function works. So that's the mirrors restored. Now I'm gonna change the diff oil. First, remove the fill plug. Oh, overfilled. This was replaced not long ago. I'm gonna go ahead and say that. Yeah, that looks far too good. Yeah. How can I know that? It's not in the service records. I don't have service records, that is. So what we have here is the diff plugs with O-rings integrated in them. And the geniuses who replaced the diff oil used a crush washer there and completely destroyed the O-ring. So that's neat. And this is why it was leaking, remember? That we found in the first episode that the 
the foil was leaking from the drain plug. Yeah, that'll do it. I'm gonna run to the dealer and hopefully they have these in stock because I forgot to buy them. Estoy back. I got six of them. Better to have some in stock. Lit it up. Rain you plug with an O-ring. Good and twist. This is an open diff, so we are using 75W90 from Liquid Molly. Oh, there it is. Now we're gonna let it drip out until it slows down. Then we can refit the plug. Started to drip, which means we can refit the plug. And with that, the diff shouldn't leak anymore. We will also be replacing the rear subframe bushings, just not on a four post lift. I'm working on getting another two post lift in the dojo. More on that soon. The transmission, we are not going to service it or touch it at this point at all. I want it to die. Okay, that way I'll have no choice but to swap in a six speed manual. It's not leaking and it appears to be working fine. So that's gonna stay as it is for now until I source the parts to do the manual swap. This ugly looking thing is the rusty muffler, the stock rusty muffler that is, and we're going to replace it now. So let's take it out. Ooh, got mud. That's, that's an impressive amount of mud there. Langsam bitte. That was... Quick, Ugh. let's poke some mud. Yeah, this car definitely went off-roading. How is it possible that it has this much mud in it? <laughs> My God, what did they do to you, you poor thing? Absolutely insane. Yeah, this bumper is gonna come off for paint. Anyway, so that'll be a good opportunity to clean it. Look, mud there, here as well. Ridiculous! This is the new exhaust. I bought it from Schmiedemann. Couple of reasons I went with this one. First of all, it is a high quality stainless steel exhaust. Second, the price, around 400 euros. That is a pretty good deal for a stainless steel exhaust. And third, it has dual tips in the back twin tips, if you will, and they are rolled as well, which is my favorite type of exhaust tips. And I think it's gonna look beautiful on the car. They didn't have the stock tips in the stock, so I bought it like this, and then I got this on eBay, straight from Compton. Nope, pretty sure it's China, but looks good, fits good, so should work just fine. Transfer over the hanger that I replaced previously. Because this exhaust was only made for one pipe here we're gonna have to do a little bit of chop chop here but don't sweat this entire bumper needs to be repainted so when they do that they're gonna make all of this pretty right now I'm just gonna hack it up a little bit so it can fit two tips come on man what's with the mud I thought we were past this I don't want to scratch my exhaust man this one is so much lighter than the other one I can lift it with one hand. Oh no. Okay, travel in paradise. The stock 530i exhaust is 64 millimeters diameter. And then this connection here, it's 74 millimeters on Schmiedemann exhaust. They also supply two of these. This one is 70 and that fits snugly into there. And then there's another smaller one. This one is 67. And this goes over this. Actually, it doesn't go over this. It's too small, actually. This one goes over this, but it's still... See, I can't connect this properly and then make it seal. So some custom work will have to be done. I did call Schmiedemann just right now, and they told me that they make these exhausts to fit their complete Schmiedemann exhaust, not the stock bummer. I got it. I got it. Double clamped. I'd rather do this than weld the exhaust and make it more difficult to remove. So I clamped it here, the middle pipe to the stock exhaust, and then the rear exhaust to that one over there, and that should work just fine. This is temporarily bolted in place, so I can cut out the exhaust. I'm gonna make a mark roughly where I need to cut. I'm gonna go find an incorrect tool and start cutting the bumper. Okay, that one will work just fine there. That's one mounted, and then the second one needs to go. No, it looks wonky. Did I say that these tips fit good? Take it back, take it right back. These tips are horrendous. So this is just gonna be temporary solution. It should be good. We have enough clearance, so I'm gonna take this off, make this a little bit smoother. Paint to touch up. 
Got exhaust paste from Liquid Molly here. Exhaust paste on this part here. Then this one goes in here. And this goes here. Finally, exhaust paste here. The tips, as I mentioned previously, this is just going to be a temporary setup until I can find something better or Schmiedemann gets theirs in stock because those are longer, look better, fit better, and it's just gonna look a lot better than this. But for now, we're gonna run this crap. Ah, oh, yeah, that looks good, man. I like it. I like the cutout. Should have made a swooping line here. What do you think, Matsi, huh? Good or a nine? This looks much better than the single ugly tailpipe. So you get a rough idea of how this is going to look like. They're gonna smooth this line out here, make it the same way that it is here. And then in this corner, I'm gonna save this piece so they can cut it out and then weld it in and make a nice swoopy curvy action here. And it's gonna look original. Oh yeah, that's the goal. Just with two tips. All right, let's see what it sounds like. Ooh, spicy. And needless to say, if this ends up droning, it ain't staying. This has a lot more burble than the stock exhaust, that's for sure. But again, we'll see if this is drony and too loud. If it is, then it's gonna go. Anyway, we're gonna let the car warm up and then we're gonna give it a couple of... While it's getting nice and warm, I'm just gonna check for exhaust leaks. Appears to be sealing just fine. We have some condensation coming through, but that's totally fine. The main reason for this exhaust is, as I said, looks it looks a lot better than one ugly tailpipe. And I want a little bit more sound from this six cylinder. Not too loud or screamy or noisy or droney, just a little bit sporty. When you start it, you can say, hey, that is a petrol engine and not a vacuum cleaner. So far it sounds good, definitely deeper and throatier compared to stock, which is what I was going for, but we'll see if it's too loud and too drony once we start driving the car. Got the new shaft here for the rear wiper, and as you can see, this one moves freely, unlike the old one. Yep, it's working. Yes. Then we have a, a cap that goes here, and then a brand new cover. That's a job well done. And with that, we are ready for the tooth inspection. So I'm gonna go see the tooth man and I'll catch you a bit later. What you doing, Mutsi? She's so spoiled. She's so cute when she runs. All right, let's see. Let's clean up and then it's cerveza time. It's 300 years later. It passed, of course. Were you having any doubts? Really? I got the plates as well. So let's put them on. Yep. Hey, now. I can't wait to polish this car. We have a little bit of rust here that we need to take care of. The license plate frame took the paint off here, so it started to surface rust. I have the scuff up pin here. Brake cleaner, touch up paint. Let that dry and then we'll apply a clear coat. Plates look cool, don't they? Totally random. No, I picked them personally. I know I said I'm gonna put up these license plate frames up for sale on the website, but to be honest with you, I just don't have the time. I'm super stretched 
thin. Everything that you see and you don't see, it's done by me. Filming repairs, research, buying parts, video editing, then running a business behind it, tax every month and all of that crap, then dealing with merchandise. And then there's my personal life as well. I have a girlfriend, okay? And she's pissed most of the time because all I'm doing is this. So please bear with me. They're gonna come whenever they come. Lastly, the Green Party sticker. This is the old one. You can see that it says RW, as in Rottweil. I don't know why the previous bastard decided to put the sticker where you can't actually see it. It should go right here. Now, you would think that we're gonna go for a drive, but negative, sir. We need to do more work. More fixing is needed. Some small details. This is the old style worn out wheel cap. Have a fresh one here from the dealer. Let's line it up with, with BMW here. BBS valve cap. The wheels actually came with these, but one was missing, so I got a new set. Back in the windshield area, we need to replace this rubber seal that's disintegrating. This is a very common thing on E39, E60, E90, all of those models. This cracks due to age and just exposure to sun. We are also going to paint the wiper arms. They are faded, as you can see, and there's a little bit of rust there. And also replace the windshield cowl because it's starting to crack there. We're going to use some tape to mark the position of the wiper arms. Well, that was easy. Yeah, this plate here needs to come out as well. But we need to mark its position like that. There it is. Now I can remove these clips here. And now we can remove the clips. Just to be clear, in order to replace this rubber seal, you don't have to remove the windshield cowl. I'm just doing it because it's not in good condition and I want to replace it as well. First, we're gonna paint all of this stuff so it can dry. Gonna use a fine scotch brite to scarf up the surface. So we can paint this as well. This is the brand new cowl. To protect this trim, we are going to use Gion trim coating, which is like ceramic coating. But first we need to prep the surface with surface prep. And now we're gonna use a trick that Eve showed us. Gonna use my old ADAC card. No longer a member. They were spamming me quite literally far too much with actual letters. So I decided to quit. It's 2023. I don't need letters in mail every week. Nothing ever good comes in mail. It's always money. They always want money. This is the brand new seal, and this can be a bit tricky to install depending on how the windshield was installed. If you have too much sealant in the in the channel then it can be a bit tricky to push it in but we'll see what happens we can start in the corner here now i can start pushing on the side this one needs to go in between the sealant and the windshield and then it kind of catches sealant is in the way here of installing the seal properly Good news, we need a new windshield. I've been monkeying around with this for about an hour and I just can't get the seal to go in on the sides at all. I tried everything that I can think of. 
silicone spray, heat gun, some sort of grease, pushing really hard, it just won't budge. And I've done three or four of these in the past, and sometimes you get lucky and you can just use your thumb and it's gonna go in, but that all depends on how the windshield was installed. And from the factory, and when they replaced this windshield, they first put the seal on the windshield itself, and then they put the whole thing on the car, so you get a lot of sealant squeezing out on the sides, and sometimes it just makes it really difficult if you want to replace this and not remove the windshield. So with that in mind, we are going to replace the windshield. This is the original windshield, I believe. It has a ton of stone chips, two big ones actually over there, and I just called brand new one. It's 450 euros with installation. So I'm gonna drive the car tomorrow to the auto glass shop and let them do it. Not exactly what I planned, but it is what it is. Just got back from the machine shop. No, auto glass repair shop, and I have actual good news. I forgot I have this little thing called insurance. I don't have full coverage on this car, but I do have a partial coverage, tile casco, half casco, which covers all of the glass on the car. And the lady told me because the windshield has so many stone chips everywhere and two big ones over there, the insurance is going to cover the replacement of the windshield. So that worked out well. They need to order the windshield, so I'm gonna go back there in two days. And in the meantime, we can do something else. All right, I got new tips for the exhaust, but first we're going to replace this parking sensor here. The parking sensors are not working and I pulled the codes and it's telling me that this one here is bad. The only problem is it appears that you have to remove the bumper to get to it because it's right next to the crash barrier. I don't know if it can come out. Oh, that's not the bumper. That's the stupid tow hook stuff. Oh man, it's right in the way. <sighs> Might need to pull the bumper off. <laughs> nope, nope. I have to pull off the bumper. Couldn't have been this one. No. Have to be the one in the middle. Okay, what's, what else is holding you in? Ah, there you go. Where are you, parking sensor? It's actually pretty easy to remove this bumper. Oh, finally. Here's the new one. Plug it in. Ignition on. No. What? Okay. No worky. I am confused. Okay, as it turns out, all of the sensors in the back are bad. I only bought two, thinking I only saw a code for one. It's good to have another spare one, but this one is bad, and this one is bad as well. So I replaced these two here, which are working perfect, and the ones in the front are working perfect as well. So I need to order two more. So we gotta come back to this later as well, because I need to order two new sensors. We're going to put two brand new ones here, that way I don't have to pull off the bumper again. Oh, come on. It's like I'm replacing the most difficult thing in the world. Oh. Got the new tips here, 76 millimeters, which is exactly what I wanted. And this is from a company called Fox, German exhaust maker, and this is stainless steel, so good quality. Unfortunately, the size of the diameter of the pipe is not the same as one of these, so I had to buy an adapter, and then my landlord welded that in, because it wouldn't fit otherwise, and then I just put high temperature resistant paint over the welds, and this now slides in. And then I can use a clamp on the other side and this is gonna look beautiful, but I have to cut the bumper a little bit more. How did it go into my eye? I'm wearing my protection. Got a clamp here. I'm gonna need to cut the bumper more here. After a ton of adjustments, I finally got it to fit right. And even if you, it's not gonna hit the bumper. Hello, love. Finally finished, and I think that looks pretty snazzy. Don't you agree? I had some leftover rubber trim, so I used that to cover my ugly cuts, and then this tip here is tucked in by 10 millimeters. I took that measurement from the M3 over there, and it kind of follows the line of the bumper. So this looks spot on to me, exactly what I wanted. This actually looks pretty good. I mean, it blends in with the rear bumper and whatnot, so. Quite happy with how it turned out here.
Now we're gonna address a common issue on the E39, E38, and E53 platform, which are dead pixels in the cluster. The old ribbon cable inside that connects the LCD display to the board is glued in place from the factory, and that glue lets go over time, and that's why you end up with dead pixels. So we're gonna remove the cluster now and perform the repair. I can't even read how many kilometers the car has. To take the cluster out, brought a simple three T9 screws here. Oh, I can undo them by hand. Let me go get some tools, man. Pop the wood trim, which we are going to replace once we start refurbishing the interior. Two screws. This one here is melting the plastic. Pop the one on this side as well. Come in! Disconnect. Connectors here. Oh! Then more screws. So three connectors in the back. And slide it out. This is what we need to do this repair. I bought this from Pixel Fix from Budapest. Comes with instructions. Brand new LCD display with silver ribbon cable. I also bought some spare bulbs just in case and tools to safely remove the needles. I've used Pixel Fix a few times in the past. I've done the cluster in my E39 M5 back in 2018 and that cluster is still perfect. I've done a few other clusters as well, Project Dubai and other E39. Anyway, let's take this puppy apart and do the repair. First, we need to remove the front cover. And as you can see, no one messed around with this cluster before. This sticker here is intact. We need to press in this clip so we can pull the cover off and this comes with the toolkit. So this just slots in here. You can use zip ties here as well if you don't have this. Two more here. Now I need to take pliers and turn these holders here so we can pull out the cover. So you have to essentially overturn them until they line up with the cover so they can come out without any, without catching. That one is good. This is just like a safety thing. Put this on the side. Now we need to remove T10 screws all around and then we can remove the cover in the back. Now I can start prying off the cover in the back. These connectors here, they have clips here on the sides that we need to press in and then pull off the cover. There are two clips on the bottom as well. Now I need to remove the LCD display and it's held with four screws to the board which are behind this white plastic. And from this point on you have two methods to choose from how you're going to access them. Number one is to remove the gauges and then you can simply pull out this complete face. And the second method is the one that I've been using in the past and that is to lift this cover ever so slightly and start drilling holes so you can access the set screws and undo them. It is a good method, worked for me a few times, no issues whatsoever. It's just you have to be a little bit tedious and careful how you drill so you don't drill too far or too off. But this time around, I think I'm going to remove the needles. I was afraid to do that in the past because I'm always skeptical of putting them back in and if I'm going to put them in the exact same spot because you can see that these, they have a stop here so it doesn't matter as much for them, but here, you have to put them in the exact same spot as before, otherwise they're not going to read correctly. I'm gonna mark them somehow, and then we are going to start pulling off the needles. So I'm gonna get a small piece of tape, put it underneath of the needle, and then take a pen and mark its position. Like that. So Pixel Fix says that you don't have to mark these, but I kinda want to, okay? So I lifted this needle over the shaft here and as you can see this has an internal stop as well so we're gonna mark the position of that needle so i'm going to carefully lift this needle over the stop here so this is its stop here the internal one so now we can mark the position there as well and lastly this one that's the position of all needles marked. The next step is very important. You can't simply start pulling out these needles. If you do that, you'll pull out the shaft from the step motor and completely ruin it. You're gonna have to replace it. That's why we have these tools from Pixel Fix. With this tool here, we're going to hold the shaft in the back and then this white plastic goes underneath the needle here. And then while we're holding the shaft, we can pop this needle off with a screwdriver and the shaft is going to stay in place. This is gonna be a bit tricky to show you, but the tool that holds the shaft in place goes between the board and the spring on the motor there. So I read online that these can be 
stuck on the shaft pretty good as well. That's one needle safely removed and we didn't scratch the face. I am gonna keep these in order, even though these two are the same, right? Yep. Nice. And this one here, we don't need to hold the shaft in the back. In fact, you can't even access it. This has a different type of mechanism so we can simply pop it out. That wasn't too bad. Just gotta be a bit careful when prying them up. And now we can lift this up. And now you can see the four screws holding the panel in that you would otherwise drill through the white plastic to get to. T8. The panel is press fit into the board so we can jam a screwdriver here and gently pry it up. All right, this one is off. Do this very gently, do not force. There it is. And there you can see the old ribbon cable. So just peel it off like onion. Now we need to remove the metal plate that's holding the LCD to the panel. There are five clips in total and be careful here if you're using the LCD. There you have it. This is the ribbon cable that creates connection between the LCD and the board and from the factory this was glued into place which was a design flaw because glue is obviously not going to last. You're gonna start losing a connection here and then you're gonna start losing pixels. They fixed this on later models and I believe in the last year of the E39 as well. And our repair is not going to involve glue or soldering or anything like that. It's gonna involve pressure. So this is the brand new display here. I went for a brand new display because the price difference between the just the cable and the display is not that much. If you want, you can just buy a silver ribbon cable and then reuse your old LCD. That's 15 euro, but brand new display that already has ribbon cable attached to it is 27 euro. And that saves you a bit of time and you get a brand new LCD. So our repair is going to be based on pressure, creating a permanent contact. This side of the ribbon cable is already attached to the LCD display, which as I said, saves a bit of time. And this pad here is what's going to put pressure on the cable here and just create that good, nice contact. What we need to do now is clean up this contact surface area here, then use scotch tape and attach the cable to the board, perfectly position it in place. And then we're gonna put more stuff underneath of these pads here. And that's what's going to create pressure on this cable here and make a permanent connection. This is going to last the lifetime of the car because there's no glue or solder to crack. It's just, you know, pressure. That's not gonna go anywhere because you have screws and stuff holding it in place. First, we need to clean up the surface here and remove old glue. For that, I'm gonna use some Q-tips and alcohol. Alcohol is not working. Okay, let's bump it up to acetone. Got acetone here, it's working better. You can see the difference between clean and not clean. The pads on the ribbon cable are clean. Do not touch that with alcohol or acetone, but this is how we need to line it up. All of the contact pads need to overlap each other because even if you miss one, you're gonna lose one pixel. So now we're gonna apply a bit of scotch tape here and please don't get confused. This is not what's going to hold the ribbon cable to the board. It's just to keep it in place when we assemble this, the pressure pads are going to create permanent pressure on the ribbon cable. Now, line up the contact pads perfectly. So all of the contact pads are overlapping each other, which is what we want. And now get a postcard from your ex-lover, or if you don't have that, then thick paper will do, because we need to cut this to shape and then put it underneath of these pads, which is going to provide additional pressure, which we need in order to create good contact. Push that in and then the pad goes back in. Clean carbonius, clean the panel here. There's a protective plastic on the LCD that we can remove now. Now we can put the panel back on. Push it back in. Now last chance to clean the display on the inside. Flip the LCD over and then push it into place like that. And just make sure that the 
pad on the back in the form or twist. Now the frame, gotta be gentle here. If you push too much, you can break the screen. There it is, clipped into place. Now we can put back the four screws. And that's pretty much it as far as the ribbon cable and the LCD goes. And here, hopefully you can see how the pad is pressing onto the ribbon cable that's then pressing onto the LCD display and creating nice firm contact. And at this point, we need to test and see if the repair is successful. If we still have some pixels out, then we need to take it apart again and probably put more pressure onto the ribbon cable. Ah, looks like we have one line that's slightly out and we have a dead bulb as well. But yeah, one of the contacts didn't line up properly. I can never get this right from the first. I've done a couple of times, but never from the first try. I'm gonna take it apart again and just see where I messed up. Say hello, hot to working pixels. This was a battle to get to work and I'm gonna explain in a minute why, but they are all finally working properly, not a single row of dead pixels. And we also had dead bulbs in the panel, three of them actually. So I replaced them too, and now it's lit up properly as well. And we are going to do the cluster test a bit later once we put back the needles. For now, I can see that all of the pixels are working and we are good to proceed and reassemble the cluster. So this didn't exactly go according to the plan. Yesterday, I spent a few hours trying to get this to work. You saw me putting in the first LCD and with that one, I had a few rows of dead pixels. And no matter what I did, repositioning the cable, adding more spaces between the pads and the panel, nothing worked. I just couldn't get it to work. And then I removed it and realized that the contact pads on this one actually, on the sides here, the black pins, just came off. I didn't even touch it. Thankfully, I ordered a spare one thinking something like this might happen or I might ruin the cable or whatever. Put that one in, same story. Can't get the pixels to work no matter what I do. Reposition the cable, add more pressure on it. I even took it off from the LCD display thinking maybe it's not positioned here correctly and then put everything back together. I know it's 100% aligned and it has proper pressure on the cable, just wouldn't work. And I was about to give up and then I remembered I did this job on Project Dubai two or three years ago, and I bought a spare LCD display with a cable, put that one in, so the third one, and that one worked from the first try. The same way I was putting these two in. That annoyed me a little bit, so I wrote an email to Pixel Fix and asked them if it's possible that these two that they sent me now are bad. And they told me if the third one worked from the first try, that means these two are most likely bad. Hashtag disappointed. Where's the quality control, man? But anyway, they were nice enough and told me to send these two back and they're gonna send me two spare ones that they're going to test so I can have them as a backup for when I do this job on Project Hovde E39M5, whenever that is. But anyway, this is now permanently fixed, as I said. There's no soldering, there's no glue. You just have constant pressure pushing on the ribbon cable, so it's gonna last the lifetime of the car. Now you're gonna start putting back the needles and here you don't wanna push them all the way because then the needle will drag on the surface here and it won't move properly. So we wanna push them in, but not all the way. We wanna give it some space. Hey, it doesn't work now. It won't spring back fully and it's not catching on anything. Hmm. All right, let's put the rest of them and then we'll test this in the car, see what happens. That's pretty spot on. So that one is good. And that one is good. This one. And this one. Don't spring back like before. These three are all fine. These two not so much. But let's put it in the car and see what happens. Turn the key. Hmm. The gauges did move. Actually, let me read the fuel gauge. It's actually reading perfectly. A bit less than before, but you know why? I had to drive the car to the shop to get the windshield replaced. So that's correct. It did use a bit of fuel. All of the pixels are good. I'm monitoring gauges. This one is sticky. Nicht gut. There, you can see it. See that? Shouldn't do that. So I found a video from Pixel Fix and Apparently this will happen if you pull out the shaft a little bit when removing the needles. And we can use a hammer to kind of push the shaft of the needle a little bit back into the step motor. And then it should work nice and smoothly. 
So let's try that. I also noticed that this shaft is sticking out more than any of the other needles. So, a couple of love taps. That went in a bit. Oh, hey, look at that. Now it actually springs back into position on its own. It's working exactly the same as before and it's stopping exactly the same as before. Well, this one, not really. So we're gonna remove this one as well and then tap that shaft a couple of times too. Smack that. That's as far as I feel comfortable tapping on this thing. Bloody brilliant. That's perfect. Let's position it where it was before. Look at that. Now all of them are working exactly the same as before. Let's give it one final test. Yes, sir. Everything working perfectly fine. No dead pixels and all of the gauges are moving freely. Yeah. Success! Sweet and sour schnitzel. Now we can carefully remove the tape. Now we can put back the back cover. Put this on the side. Surface prep. Let's see how badly scratched up it is. A lot of scratches actually. Ooh, something sticky around here. Chick-fil-A probably. I think we need to polish this. I don't know if you can see that, probably not, but lots of swirls and scratches in the plastic. I have red and white paste for polishing plastic and other stuff. A foam pad, and let's see what it does. I've used it in the past on clusters and it does make some improvements, but obviously not perfect. So it removed the big scratch, but it created a ton of small scratches. Guires 205, finishing polish. Actually, that's pretty decent. So I'm gonna go over the entire plastic with red and white and then follow up with Meguiar's 205. There you have it. Not perfect, but improved. I also ordered from Pixel Fix these rings that go inside of the cluster. And these are plastic, but they have aluminum brushed look to them. So it's not chrome or anything like that. It's nice satin finish. And this is pretty much going to be a personal taste. Either you like it or don't. I kind of do. And some of these clusters did come with this from the factory. E39 M5 and also some other E39 clusters and also E46. But anyway, I had this on my original E39 and I like the look of it. So I'm going to put it in here as well. I put them in and then promptly took them out because there's excess material on the edge here. Maybe you can see it but there, I believe from the molding process or whatever. So I'm going to get a file and just smooth that out. So once you put it in the cluster, you can't see it. File and just give it a couple of rab rab dabs. Most excellently. Satisfies my OCD. So use compressed air to blow out the inside of it. Clean this. Use compressed air to blow this out as well. But gently. Don't forget this plate here. No dust. It looks pretty good. Finito. It looks beautiful, doesn't it? Now we can bend back the tabs. I'm gonna write pixel fix like that. Now let's put it back in the car. There you go. Everything working perfectly and we have no dead pixels. But anyway, which method would I recommend for this repair? I think if you're doing this for the very first time, drilling seems like a safer method, less room for error. Because if you mess up the position of the needles or you mess up the little mortar, then you have to order the parts and you're gonna be down for a few days until you get all of that. Pixel Fix does have new mortars in stock. So 
even if you mess it up, you can fix it. Uh, me personally, next time I'm doing this, I'm probably gonna remove the needles because it's faster and cleaner and I'm comfortable doing it because I've already done it and I know how to do it. A brand new windshield has been installed. I dropped off the car today at a nearby auto glass repair shop. St. Gobain secured, so OE or OEM. Not sure, it is a good quality windshield. Same as before, green stripe with a rain sensor. And you can see how nicely the rubber seal now sits. And as I said, they first put the rubber seal on the windshield and then everything goes in together like that. So sometimes you get lucky and you can just replace the rubber seal without removing the windshield. But majority of the time you have to take out the windshield. I've done it several times on E39, including my original one and my M5 as well. But on this one, it was no dice. And for the love of God, please don't go poking with screwdrivers and knives and scalpels all around. You'll just create rust spots and it's gonna be a nightmare to fix later. Now I realize how bad the old windshield was. It was just completely blasted. So it's nice to have one that's clear as day. So I'm recording on the rivets as well. And we have clips here. Clean plastic covers here. Now I need to line up this one with the marks that I made. I'm gonna test it first. That is actually perfect. The torque spec is written on the wiper arm, 40 millimeters. Cover. These are 20 millimeters. Caps. And now you can see how everything looks pretty and refreshed here. And with that, see you manana. Morning. I think I was so tired yesterday, I forgot about these covers in the corner here. Lovely. Got two more brand new sensors, so let's swap them out. Okay, let's see if it finally works. Okay, all of them are working in the back now, that's good. We have one that's dead in the front. This one here doesn't work. Oh. Working. Finally, we have all eight working parking sensors. As I started using the hatch, the glass shocks are not good after all. Got new parts here, so I'm gonna replace them real quickly. The old one. Yes. Perfect. Much better. Oh my God, what is happening? Here's the missing cover, brand new original part. First we need to get rid of the old butyl. That looks much nicer. So that finally looks correct and the struts are working, so job done. Brand new spoiler, original part from the dealer. I'm gonna grab the tiny screws. Did you think that we were done fixing electrical components on this car? We aren't. See that over there? This is the original 16 by nine navigation and this is a typical screen failure. We have this big smudge or stain of dead pixels or whatever, and we need to replace this screen in order to fix it. So let's remove the navigation unit and start to repair. First, we need to remove this plastic frame and then screws all around. First, we need to remove this cover here. Next, we need to unclip these two ribbon cables. There's this white plastic that we need to pull up to release the cable. Gently. Now we have two screws on each side and then we can pull out the entire panel. Careful, don't pull too hard. Pull the knobs out. Four screws. There's a connector on the bottom, so be careful with that. Now we need to disconnect the connectors. One of the connectors.
connectors here the plastic broke so I'll have to glue it in place not a big deal very good six screws that's the screen remove this piece of tape here we need to disconnect this connector here Four screws. And that's the LCD. Remove this ribbon cable as we need to reuse it. Here's the brand new screen. Came straight from China. I tried hard to find the original part, but it's nowhere to be found. This is the only thing that's available for this navigation. Paid 50 bucks, if memory serves me right. And it says Sharp and Japan on it. So, you know, as long as it works, I'll be happy. I believe now we need to remove this metal frame and get the LCD out. I don't know if this tape is holding the thing in, but I'm going to remove it anyway. Then this back cover. I don't see any screws or anything. Oh, this is loose now. Yeah, this one says Sharp Japan on it. Same as this one. Oh, wait. Plastic frame is breaking. Actually, it broke already, so whatever. So we need to remove the plastic frame. There it is. Broken in three pieces. But the LCD is out, and you can see here where we have dead pixels. See if we can glue back this frame. Speedy fix. Just a tiny dab. That's the frame glued back in place with speedy fix. Let's remove old glue. Now I'm gonna get a file and just smooth this out here. Blow this out with compressed air. Time to get the new one in. It should. Slide in. It did, this cover. Make sure it clips all around. And now just reverse the reassembly. Put the ribbon cable back in. That's all of the connectors plugged in. Now we're gonna tape this ribbon cable. This is mainly so it doesn't get damaged when we put everything back together. Gonna clean this up a little bit first. Yep, that looks correct. Now we're gonna clean it a little bit. Replug the ribbon cables. Now we can test it. Moment of, did I f up or not? Whoa, it's perfect. Wait a minute. Why is the screen off center now? As you can see, the screen is working perfectly. It looks beautiful, but it's slightly off center. As you can see here, there's a black line here, and then it goes a bit to the right. And I just found on M5 board that we need to remove this cover. And then there are some adjustment thingies that you turn and then we can adjust the angle of it. So I'm going to remove this cover here and try to adjust it. I just took it apart again and the information that I found on forum is a bit misleading. There are adjustment screws here on the back of the board and these are used for adjusting contrast, brightness and that sort of stuff. So don't touch them if you're satisfied with the look of the picture. But to move the position of the screen to reposition it, we need to use the two screws on the back of the LCD here. And that's a bit tricky because everything needs to be loose, yet connected and working. And we can use a bit from my tool cart, get it in there, and then just move it left and right until we get the picture exactly in the center. Put that back in. And let's make sure it works. 
it does. We need to adjust the horizontal line and it says on the back H position. Ooh, nearly there. That's perfect, exactly in the center. All right, that's adjusted. Now I'm gonna go put it back together. So if you are replacing this LCD display, I recommend that you plug it in while everything is still apart so you can make sure that this is centered and you don't have to take it apart again. Perfect. Got new original knobs from the dealer as well. The old ones are, because this is rubber, they don't look that good or feel that good. How satisfying it is to fix all tech, huh? Working navigation screen, working pixels in the cluster. Honestly, for 50 euros, I'm really happy here. The screen is actually nicer than the old one, the colors and the contrast, it's, it's a bit nicer. And you can also adjust brightness here, although it does look brighter on the camera than it is in person. But take it down a couple of notches. Let's say there. And everything still works as it should. Really happy with that. And now it's finally time to go for a drive. There we go. Bon voyage. Right from the start, hitting one of many, many potholes that City of Frankfurt has. This car is so much more comfortable than E46. The suspension is just better. You have two control arms in the front while E46 has one and then there's noise, vibrations, and all of that getting transferred to the cabin. Here, you're much more isolated. It just feels, well, it is a level above in luxury and comfort. So I'm already quite happy, quite familiar with this feeling. Brings back good memories with my old original E39. The suspension is just brilliant. It's exactly what I want because Frankfurt has terrible roads, really, really bad roads. And E46, it just becomes slightly uncomfortable when going over potholes and stuff. As far as rattles in the interior, something is rattling in the rear left door panel where the sunshade is broken. So I need to take that apart and see what's going on. Oh yeah, I'm using the steering wheel from E39 M5, Project Hovde because I sent the one that has heating to be refurbished. The letter is worn and I'm going to be putting that one back in, even though it's not as good as this one because it's four spoke and this one feels much better in your hands, but it does have heating and I definitely want to keep that. It is a very, very cool option to have in winter. The main goal of this car is comfort and luxury. Oh, the brakes are good. The brakes are really good. I love how the pedal feels. It's nice and firm and you have this really nice progressive feel in the pedal. So when you press it, it starts biting and as you press it more, it's, it's biting even harder and it just gives you a beautiful, nice feel. It gives you confidence when you're braking, which is something I don't have in Alpina, which we're going to fix in the next episode. I had to use 12 millimeter spacers in the front to clear the front calipers, which is about 12 millimeter more than I wanted to use, but it is what it is. There is one slight issue that we're going to talk about in a second. Support. Yeah, this is one of the issues. Steering wheel vibration between 120 and 170. Ah, even now, a little bit. Now, not so much. Shift, please. Feels brilliant, the engine. Pulls really smooth and clean, 230 horsepower. Not plenty enough, that's about to change soon. 200 in a curve, feels pretty stable. And this is the stuff where it's better than my E46. I'm doing 200 on the Autobahn, 4,000 RPM, the wind noise is, you can't hear anything because there's no stupid sunroof. It's just a nice, comfortable car to cruise at higher speeds. And this is why I gave up from doing the supercharger thing on the E46, because I can give it more power, but that's still not gonna make it comfortable at higher speeds. So yeah, we have steering wheel shake. After filming this, I found the issue to be with H&R wheel spacers that I used. 
I have a new set coming and I'll give you an update on this in the next episode. Everything else feels great. The clank matic is good, ships fine. It's not the greatest transmission in the world, but you know, for daily driving and cruising, it's, it's good. The seats, I'm on a hunt for a Contour E38 seats. And they are exactly the same like this, except they have bolstering all around and then the upper part does this as well. But they are incredibly hard to find. And the exhaust, it's brilliant. I was listening to the before and after video yesterday and you can't tell the difference that much because you can hear more engine noise than the exhaust. And I know some will say it's not loud enough. And for me, it's perfect. I don't want it any louder. I just want when you start the car to have that nice deep burbly sound. And it has that. And then when you're on the highway, it's not droning or anything. Like I'm gonna shut up now. We're doing 130, two and a half thousand RPM. There's no noise from the exhaust whatsoever. So it's a pretty great value for money, that exhaust. But this is what I wanted from the new daily driver to be comfortable in the city over potholes and to be comfortable at higher speeds on the Autobahn. And this car ticks all of those boxes. And as you can see, the gauges are perfect. The coolant temp gauge is exactly in the middle where it was before, so I definitely put them back in the right place. Man, the brakes are really good, really good. I know I said that before, but I am really happy with this. It's actually much better brake pedal feel than E39 M5. Now you can hear the exhaust a little bit, but again, it's not annoying. It's not, you know, annoying drone that you can get rid of. Did you know that E39 six cylinder version has better steering than E39 M5 and E39 540i? That's because it has steering rack instead of steering box. I oh, yeah, needless to say, wheel alignment was done. It was way off. A nice subscriber burned me a tape. No, that's CDs. Recorded? Made me a tape? I don't know, it's been a while since I've used a tape. Back to the classics, 80s and 90s. Ooh, 36 touring. Yep, it definitely works. I can't play the music because, or I have to talk over it because copyright, but it sure does work. And then this one, 90s Eurodance. You can go here. Look at that. See, with the window open, we're doing 50 now. You can hear sound from the exhaust, which is awesome, but it's not too loud. And Infinita's supercharger is on its way. But first, we need to sort out the interior because currently it's really disgusting and there's still a lot of stuff that's broken. And as I said, sort out the seats. Then we're gonna polish the paint and I gotta fix the rust in the back and the bumpers, but I might do that a bit later because I really wanna put the supercharger on this car and see how it feels then. We're gonna do before and after run on the dyno and see what the results are. Mark my words, E39 is going to be a major classic one day. I mean, it already is, but it's gonna be an even bigger one. And I keep looking at eBay Kleinanzeige, which is like Craigslist in Germany. There are pages and pages of these cars getting parted out. And it's the same deal as with E30s. Five, six years ago, they were everywhere, super cheap. Now, even a junky one is two, three, four or 5,000 euros and it's full of rust. It's just that they're, they're gone. People are parting them out like crazy. And I have a feeling same thing is gonna happen with E46, E39. E38, it's already difficult to find part outs in Germany. There aren't that many. Like for E39, there are like nine, 10 pages. For E38, one or two. So M Sport suspension, it's not like Bilstein. Bilstein, it still maintains comfort. All those Zach shocks, they're noticeably or significantly softer than Bilstein's shocks. But Bilstein, it just makes the whole car feel more planted, more, it handles a lot better than this. This is still floaty, you know? And I don't mind that on this car because I'm all about comfort with it. But on other cars like my M3 or E46 or E39 M5, I want the handling as well, which is why I have a V6 on them. See, a manual would be much more fun here.
thoroughly enjoying the drive and wondering why didn't I get an E39 Touring before earlier. They're phenomenal cars. So engine, I believe it has the full performance. It feels very healthy, pulls really clean. Transmission, perfect as well, even though we didn't service it. So as far as mechanical part of this car, it's in really, really good condition now. Ooh, look at that. Now that is cool. Another one, an old Jag. See, with Billy's, you don't get this much body roll, like with Zach's. Still feels good, though. Overall, for a first proper drive, I am really happy with everything. The car performs and drives brilliantly. It just feels fresh, tight. When I bought this car, I was told that it shouldn't be put back on the road. Couldn't disagree more with that. This is the best 5 Series ever made, in my humble opinion, and it's exactly where it belongs, back on the road. If you see another neglected E39, Hell, any old cool classic car, save it if you can. It doesn't have to be the nicest example out there. You don't have to do nuts and bolts restoration. Just start fixing it up and get it to a safe driving condition and enjoy it. And trust me, when you start fixing small things and it works in the end, it is so satisfying. Like pixels and navigation that we did here. Small things, but you've done something with your hands and made it work again as it did 20 years ago. Positively chuffed with this car. As always, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this episode, and I'll see you very soon. The next episode is going to be on Project Chicago, Alpina B7. And the sun is out. What a beautiful day. Happy Easter, everyone. Mm -hmm.